This session will cover management information systems and reports. Management accounting and information systems are an integral part in producing the information that managers use for performance measurement and performance management. Performance management information systems will provide the information which enables performance measurement to take place. The type of management information system needed will depend on the level of data needed to support the company's decisions to be made. Planning, control and decision making can be classified into a three-tier hierarchy known as strategic, tactical and operational. So let's look at each in turn. Firstly, strategic. Strategic planning is the process of deciding on the longer term objectives of the business and the high level policies surrounding them. For example, new ventures, new products, potential future growth, or maybe capacity expansion plans. Management accounting information needed to support those strategic plans will be forward looking, usually for several years, and will have an external orientation. It could also be vague, including estimates, or there could be elements of incomplete data. Examples would be product profitability, financial effects of competitor responses, or maybe the effects of acquisitions and mergers. Secondly, tactical. Tactical planning is the level below strategic planning and focuses on the most efficient and effective use of resource to support and achieve the long-term strategic plans. For example, this could include decisions around the level of resource required, money, manpower or materials, etc. It will also include decisions around the processes needed to achieve the maximum output from the level of resource used. Management accounting information needed to support tactical planning decisions will have a much shorter time horizon in comparison to strategic planning data. There will also be much more precision with a much narrower focus on information. Most of the information will be generated from within the organisation. Examples would include annual budgets for sales and production, the levels of inventory to be held, or maybe marketing and advertising campaigns. Lastly, operational. Operational decisions are the lowest tier in the hierarchy and focus on the day-to-day -day specific tasks, ensuring there is maximum efficiency and effectiveness. And just as tactical planning decisions are made to support strategic planning decisions, Operational decisions will be set within the guidelines of tactical decisions and control. Management accounting information here will be very detailed, have a very narrow focus and a very short time frame. Examples would include day-to-day -day transaction data, current inventory levels or scheduling unexpected or ad hoc work. Operational data is more often expressed in number of units, hours or maybe material quantities as opposed to monetary terms. Finally, it is important to recognise the link between the tiers on the hierarchy. For example, the board of directors of a company may decide to launch a new market with the aim of, say, taking 5% of the total market within three years. This would be a strategic decision. Senior management would then be required to plan the necessary resource to support this, e.g. man hours, equipment, advertising, sales promotion, etc. These would be tactical decisions. And then finally, lower management may set weekly targets for production and sales staff, ensuring quality of product and timely delivery to customers. In terms of the types of management information systems, there are several types that can provide data to an organisation. The first one to look at is called a transaction processing system or abbreviated to TPS. A TPS system has the ability to collect, store and modify and retrieve large volumes of data of an organisation. And the key characteristics of a TPS system are as follows. Basically, rapid response. 
If fast performance is vital to a business, the input needs to become the output in a matter of seconds. Reliability. Some organisations rely heavily on a TPS system. If potential failure could stop business, then a backup and recovery process must be in place. Inflexibility. A TPS system will follow a standard process route. It is not able to adapt or have any flexible response to any input it will receive. And finally, processing. A TPS can process data in batches or in real time. With batch processing, data is collected throughout a designated time period and processed at a later point in time, giving a time delay. However, real-time processing is the immediate processing of data. This would be vital for organisations that deal with things such as flight, train or hotel bookings, which need an immediate response. The next system is just known as the Management Information System, abbreviated to MIS. A management information system has the ability to take data from the TPS system and convert it into summary or exception reports for decision making. For example, some management information systems allow users to generate customised reports. For example, this may break down sales into product type, region, salesperson, etc. And most have different display choices, e.g. graphical or tabular. It is important to note that a management information system generally doesn't have any analytical capability. The next system worthy of note is called an Executive Information System, or abbreviated to an EIS. This system will typically draw critical strategic information data from an internal management information system and then will also allow communication with external sources of information. For example, data from competitors, maybe legislation, market research and maybe databases such as Reuters. An executive information system will typically involve data analysis and modelling tools and it is capable of performing what-if analysis to aid strategic decision making. The last system is an Enterprise Resource Planning System, or abbreviated to ERP, an ERP. An ERP system is designed in a modular way and will allow integration between the key processes of an organisation. It has the capability of serving the data needs of all the different functional departments. Typically, an ERP system will support sales and order processing, probably procurement, production, distribution, customer service, human resource and finance activities. The principal benefit of an ERP system is that it shares the same data between different departments. For example, if a customer order is entered into the system, it will check current inventory levels and prompt purchases if necessary. It will update the manufacturing schedule and deploy adequate resource at the time of manufacture. The system will update any shipping or distribution schedules and will trigger an invoice to the customer at the appropriate time. There are many benefits to be realised from a fully integrated ERP system, including the removal of inefficiencies and duplicated data with significant savings on time and effort. In addition, many ERP systems will have electronic data interchange facilities with major suppliers and customers for the automated transmission of documents such as purchase orders and invoices. A system, i.e. something that connects things up, can be either open or closed. A closed system is isolated from the external environment and data will not be provided to or received from the environment. Closed systems are very rarely found in naturally occurring situations and certainly within a business environment there is a real need to communicate and react to the external environment just in order to survive. As such, business organisations are open systems. The decisions they make will be influenced by suppliers, customers, maybe government or financial institutions.
By having an open system, a business can focus on the external factors that are critical to the success of the organisation and adapt to the changing environment as necessary. Next, we will consider the sources of management accounting information, and these sources can be both internal and external. Starting with internal source, this will include data captured within the financial accounting records, such as data from the sales and purchase ledgers, or maybe payroll data. It is important to understand that not all data will be monetary. Production data may include machine capacities, movement in inventory levels, maybe maintenance requirements or sales data. It may include the number of returns or product warranty issues. A significant amount of this data will be extracted from the company systems, but there could also be informal communications between management and staff, interviews or maybe documented meetings. External information generally tends to be more relevant to strategic and tactical decision making as opposed to operational decision making. There are many external sources. For example, a company may employ a legal expert or tax specialist who will collect information regarding their specific area and understand how this will affect the organisation and pass the information on to those who are affected. A marketing manager may commission some market research on a potential new product and organisations will hold data from their own customers and suppliers due to the interaction they have with them. Data can be obtained through internet or trade journals. External data can be either primary or secondary. Primary data is tailored to a company's exact needs. Market research commissioned by a company would be a good example of this. The advantage of primary data is it will be meaningful and 100% relevant to the company. However, the biggest disadvantage is that generally it will be more expensive than secondary data to obtain. Secondary data is not collected by the organisation itself. Examples will be government statistics, internet or public databases, or maybe data from trade journals or consumer panels. Secondary data can be very valuable to a business and both time and money will be saved in comparison to primary data. However, the disadvantage is that the data may not be totally relevant to the organisation. In addition, the data may be biased, dependent on who originally carried it out or for what purpose. Organisations using secondary data should ensure that they only use meaningful data. The costs of obtaining and using information, both internal and external, can be significant. With regard to internal data, the costs of collection, processing and the production of data can be divided into three categories, these being data capture costs, process costs and other indirect costs of producing the information in the required format. Examples of these could potentially include the costs of barcoding and scanning equipment, time for personnel to input data into a system, or maybe time spent analysing the data and producing it in a usable format. Companies should be mindful of the cost of inefficient use of information, for example, collecting data that is not needed or not used or possibly the duplication of information. With regard to external data costs, these could include the direct costs of a market research survey, maybe subscriptions to journals or magazines, and maybe the cost of internet downloads. These types of costs are easily identifiable and can be considerable. There will, however, also be indirect costs associated with external data, such as wasted time for excessive searching, processing and general information overload, the costs for which are much more difficult to identify and quantify. Once the relevant data has been collated and processed, it is important to consider the necessary controls over such information. For example, internal data may well include sensitive and confidential data. For example, personnel or payroll records, which should only be made available to certain individuals within an organisation. 
Typically, organisations may well have a procedures manual which sets out the controls for distributing internal data. This could include the format of the report, the frequency of them, who should be included on the distribution list, it will make clear as to what information is regarded as confidential and whether any paper documents could be binned or require shredding. In addition, it would be normal for employees to be contractually required not to divulge any confidential information that they are privy to. Much data now is distributed throughout an organisation via emails and it is important that organisations adequately consider computer security. With regard to internal security, management can regulate which members of staff have access to different types of data. For example, access to human resource records will be restricted to human resource personnel. Passwords can limit access to certain areas within a system and will also provide an audit trail to establish any unauthorised attempted access. Information transmitted from one part of an organisation to another could be vulnerable to interception, so it is important for companies to establish a policy for encrypting confidential data. Encryption is a method of scrambling data so it becomes unintelligible to any unauthorised party who attempts to intercept it. The growth of the internet has led to a much greater increased exposure to security risks. An organisation can protect its data from external unauthorised access by using a firewall. A firewall will selectively allow or block inbound traffic to an organisation's computer system by blocking any messages that do not conform to a specified set of criteria. They prevent unauthorised internet users from accessing private networks. In addition, computer viruses may arrive by email, which can be triggered when the user opens the email. Computer viruses can infiltrate and damage computer systems, while other spyware viruses watch activity on a computer system and then send the data over the internet to a third party. Antivirus software will scan files looking for known viruses and identify suspicious behaviour from a computer program that could indicate infection. Physical controls to data within a business could include door or cupboard locks or safes to prevent access to hardware or paper documentation.